Welcome to another episode of Municipal Focus. My name is Kevin Tachi, and I will be your host for this particular episode. Uh, the next series of Municipal Focuses that we are, we are going to be doing throughout 2024, uh, as you haven't figured out by now, uh, it is a big political year. Uh, not just on the local level, but on various levels of government. Uh, whether it's local town races, the municipal races, uh, county races, state races, oh, and the biggie, the presidential tilt. Well, we're not going to be getting that big with this conversation, uh, but we are fortunate to be able to speak with some folks uh, for th th these programs, more so locally. And today we are privileged to be speaking with a gentleman. His name is Mr. Sweezy, Ken Sweezy. Uh, you remember, he's been on uh, previously with us. Ken? Yes, thank you. Welcome to the conversation. Yeah, happy to be back for another one. Let's, uh, how are you? For folks who may or may not know who you are, let's remind them, yep. for, especially for the new voters. Yep. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, yeah. So as you mentioned, I did run in 22, was the Republican nominee for the seat, uh, talk in the 6th Plymouth District, which real quick is Duxbury, most of Pembroke, most of Hanson, parts of Halifax and Marshfield. Um, but about me, I uh, grew up in Hanson, um, has been a local guy in the district for a long time. My family's been in the South Shore for a long time. Um, we actually own a business and operate that over in neighboring Whitman. Um, Sweezy Fence has operated since 1969 uh, when my grandfather started it shortly after returning home from Vietnam. So it's been around a long time and I'm very proud of those roots uh, that we've had here. Uh, from there, uh, after kind of growing up here, I went off to school at Loyola University Chicago, got my degree in forensic science, um, sort of unique there. Uh, went on to a major metro uh, police department in St. Louis where I was a fingerprint expert for four years. So got a lot of experience, you know, in sort of that big city environment, the, you know, how crime has gone the last couple years. I think everybody's well aware of, you know, the public safety concerns and, and things like that that has really plagued the country. It's, you know, not unique to any city or state or anything like that. It's, it's on the front of everybody's minds. Um, so did that for a while. Um, once COVID hit, like a lot of people, I, you know, stepped back, reflected a little bit, um, decided that I wanted to serve in just a different capacity um, and get back home. Uh, so I left Missouri um, in 21, came back home, um, immediately started getting involved in sort of the local politics that you were already sort of mentioning, um, have volunteered on economic development for about two years, um, as well as capital improvements here in Hanson, which has been great. Uh, understanding the level of commitment that all of these volunteers do in town is is something else so Ooh. for anyone out there who doesn't know um, you know whether it's your elected you know select board school committee or the unelected volunteers it takes a lot to to run our our communities so uh, very appreciative to be a part of that uh, joined the private sector when I moved back and have been in biotech now for almost two years as well so big Massachusetts industry of course up Boston Cambridge but have been doing that and uh, slowly getting involved like I said ran in 22 and I'm back for 24. So as he, uh, as Ken has mentioned, uh, he in fact is a candidate for the 6th Plymouth District state rep seat as he did uh, previously run. But news has come out where the, uh, the governor, the, the current administration, uh, actually tapped uh, the state representative for uh, Judge Cutler for another post. I think it's a newly created uh, undersecretary for labor. Uh, and so he will be departing in the month of February which kind of leaves kind of an interesting scenario. Uh, give me your thought as to hearing the news about the, the seat opening up. Yeah, of course. So first off, um, you know, congratulations to Representative Cutler. He served this community, uh, you know, for over 11 years, um, and he was the chair of labor um, in the House. So, you know, going on to the secretary's, uh, under Secretary of Labor and working in that office, you know, is a good fit. And I can only hope that that means really good things for our district that someone from here can advocate in the administration. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's not just some other person that we're not, you know, not well aware of. So congratulations to Rep Cutler. Um, but as far as the seat itself, like you mentioned, yeah, an open seat's a huge opportunity, right? Um, no one is naive to incumbency advantages, right? Um, I know it very, very well from two years ago. Um, we ran a very, very good race. The race was the most competitive that Rep Cutler had had since his initial victory um, 11 years ago. But there's, that's definitely a dynamic that, that's at play. You know, there's that level of name recognition and things like that that goes along with that. Um, so we're really excited to sort of be on a level playing field um, with whoever 
um, from either side, Republican or Democrat, may come forward in this race. Uh, we're really excited for the momentum that we had from last cycle. Um, so an open seat, just a lot of opportunities, and I think it's uh, a chance for the towns, businesses, individuals in the district all to sort of be as open-minded as possible to a new voice and sort of a new set of ideals and, and what people think that can be accomplished in this seat. Now, nobody knows what is going to happen, I'm pretty sure. It's, I, I think it's up to the Speaker of the House to decide whether there will be a special election to fill out the remaining, the remaining year, because we, again, we still have, uh, at the time of our taping, 11 months in the legislative session. Um, will they fill it? Will there be a special election? Um, what's your thought on a special election? Uh, or do you feel you're kind of in the, whether it's a special, or, you know, for the start of 2025, are you in for both or one? Yeah, so I, I, two things about, about the race and, and the special dynamic. One, um, which I think is most important for the people of the district, right? Um, you you want to be heard up on Beacon Hill. There's going to be a lot of big fights this year, um, which I'm sure we'll get into issue specific, mm. uh, particularly around budgeting and budget cuts for this year. I think the district deserves to have somebody advocating for them and the interests of all five of our towns in this district. And to have a seat vacant for 10, 11 months, to me, that doesn't sound right. To me, I would like to see somebody representing our towns, uh, the residents of the towns, during those tough conversations, because I think that is the point of the legislature, right? They're supposed to be represented. Everybody here deserves to have that voice. So. I think in the interest of everyone in the district, the, the special would be really important. The special would be ideal. I would definitely call on the speaker to what I would consider do the right thing and make sure that there's as much uh, input from the district as possible, and that would be by having a special. With that being said, um, you know we're, we're ready for whatever may be thrown at us. Um, we, this is not a sprint. Last year, that we actually came out and declared for this race a couple months later than last time. Um, so we know it's a marathon. We're in it all the way until November, if that's what it takes. Um, you know, we're hopeful that uh, when Rep. Cutler leaves February 5th, I believe, mm -hmm. um, is the official vacating date, um, that there would be an announcement about a special. That would be ideal, like mentioned. But we have no qualms uh, if we have to run a 10-month race either, because we're ready for that. And, and giving people more opportunity to learn about the candidates, I think, is a good thing, um, generally speaking. Um, so if there's anybody else who's going to be in the race, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that everyone who's voting is well informed. So either way it breaks, uh, we're ready um, and we're excited. We think we're going to get a, a much more positive result this time. But, but it is important to make sure that everybody's voice is heard. When did you decide that you were going to jump into this race? Was this something that was already predetermined, you know, a, a year and a half ago after, you know, your first time running for office that like, you know what, we've learned a lot and we can apply it to another run? Or was it something that as of late you're like, oh, I think it's time? Yeah, I mean, I think depending on which day you asked me, the answer probably changed a little bit. But I mean, this was something that wasn't going away. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say none of my signs got thrown out. I can, I can say that with certainty. Um, so, so we were ready for, you know, if, if a good opportunity and a path to victory cleared, which we think it did, um, we, you know, we're very ready to jump in. Um, and I think that the, the feedback we've already gotten in the, the short, you know, three, four weeks since, since I declared again um, at the beginning of the month um, has shown that this was the right decision. So, How does that make you feel that your, your, your announcement has already started resonating with people? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think it's great for everybody, not just for myself. Mm. I think what it speaks to, like I already mentioned, is that sort of desire for a fresh voice and sort of a fresh direction um, for the district. I think that... Um, we, you know, the South Shore is a very unique place in the Massachusetts landscape where I would, you know, say it is a slightly more conservative area of the state. I don't think that's going too far out on a limb compared to the Boston Cambridges of, of the Commonwealth. Um, and I think that people have felt pretty unheard now um, for quite a few years. Um, so I think that's where that excitement comes, you know. Obviously, I'm, I hope that I can be that standard bearer to bring those views up to, to Beacon Hill, but it's really more indicative of, you know, a lot of great volunteers, a lot of great, you know, municipal leaders that I'm excited will, you know, be joining the team and we'll be rolling all that out and stuff um, throughout the year. But I, I think it's really indicative of the sentiment inside the district and what they want to see from their state government, so. How has it helped that you, you have name recognition and that you have remained engaged uh, in, you know, what's happening locally when it comes to this, this particular seat? 
Yep. Uh, I mean, that certainly helps, right? I think a big part of this race, um, you know, we're not starting from scratch, right? You know, I think anyone who's been involved in politics, municipal, state, federal, knows that quite a bit of, um, you know, the startup time is just getting your feet under you, learning who's who, and, you know, if you don't already know from your different communities, you know, like obviously I was volunteering already in Hanson, so I knew people here, but getting out and just meeting other people. So, you know, having a couple of those things checked off already is, is helpful. It's a good springboard, and what I like about it so much is it allows us to focus on the issues. Um, so there's not so much, you know, uh, meeting and greeting, um, if you will. You know, I get to wrap up my introductory speech a little bit sooner um, when I'm out in public now and I get to just focus on the issues that matter um, to you and to everybody in the district. So um, that's where I think the name recognition really comes in handy. Um, you know, it's not like, oh, who's this guy? Is he new? Is he outsider? I grew up here, things like that. Um, so getting to focus on the issues and really getting to the heart of what people want before they have to be, you know, just that introductory stage is where it's most important. And, and again, to, to the point I just made also is sort of, it's not I really don't consider it just like my name, right? Like it's almost like brand. This brand, this set of ideals really mm. that people want to see on Beacon Hill is what's getting recognized. So I, I, again, I'm, I'm happy to be that standard bearer for that, but it's really just making sure that people that are already in the district who already have these thoughts get to Beacon Hill with their voices. And, and that's just what I'm trying to do. So that's, that's what I think is getting recognized just as much. If you look at the issues from you know, a year and a half ago, and you measure them up to what people are concerned with today has much changed in the mindset of the voter. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, a couple things have changed, but I, I think some of the common issues have sort of stayed throughout. If you remember in 22, the ballot issues actually became quite a bit um, involved in the in the rep races in the state level races as well things like you know licenses for undocumented immigrants um, the millionaires tax the so-called fair share act things like that that were really big points I mean I think we spent our two debates last cycle half the debates were just about ballot questions and where we stood on those so um, although the ballot questions you know they broke a certain way you actually see in the district uh, that the votes actually went the opposite way of how the state voted. Um, so I think that those issues are still very prevalent and you don't see them in the ballot questions per se, but budgeting, like I just mentioned, is gonna be a very big deal this year. Obviously it's always a big deal, why more so? Because for the first time in a long time we're going into a revenue shortfall. Um, so that's gonna be a big issue. And although that isn't, you know, such a flashy issue that you may not be, you know, be used to. I mean, we just experienced there was an announcement by the biggest firefighters union in Massachusetts, $1.6 million are being cut to local fire departments. I believe it was 20 initially. Three of them are in the district. Pembroke, Hanson, Duxbury, all losing money to their fire departments because of the tough cuts that they're trying to do. I mean, no one's going to be, everyone's going to feel the effects. And if I had to guess, you know, it's $375 million now, they're projecting a billion dollar shortfall. So that means we still have a long way to go of what cuts are gonna, are gonna have to happen throughout the rest of the year. And as uh, the governor's actually giving her budget right after we finish this taping, so it's today, this week, um, and where that money's gonna come from and what programs they're gonna focus on is gonna be a really, really big fight this year. Again, why we need so to make sure that we have a voice up there. Um, another big issue that I think everyone on the South Shore is well aware of is, you know, the shelter emergency that we're experiencing right now. The migrant, the migrant yes, situation. yes. And so although we're past the fight of, you know, uh, the state decided and the ballot question decided that undocumented immigrants can get licenses in Massachusetts, um, we are going to see um, that shelter emergency is just going to worsen as we go. We're already over capacity. This was a law that was brought in right to shelter about 40 years ago. Governor Dukakis, um, you know, had this program and it was great. It was helping Massachusetts families who fell on hard times. Now over 50% of the current families that are being helped through our shelter are undocumented. Mm. Um, no problem with people wanting to come to the United States. No problem with people coming to Massachusetts. It's a great place to live. Um, there's nothing wrong with that per se. It's the the system is is not is operating well above what it was supposed to be designed for. Um, and there's actually a waiting list too. The governor set an arbitrary cap on 7,500 families. There's now a waiting list. There's news reports coming out that there were some families sadly sleeping in Logan Airport. I mean, that's inexcusable. It's Massachusetts in America in 2024, and we have families sleeping in the airport. Um, you know, the services at some point are gonna be lacking for those who are Massachusetts residents. Mm -hmm. There's actually bipartisan support for revisions 
to the right to shelter law, which I happen to support as a good um, starting point. Um, both Senator Durant out in the West, and I believe it's, um, it's a Democratic senator who was a National Guardsman and experienced it firsthand. Um, and they both want to put a one-year residency requirement on the right to shelter. I think that's a great start. I think that'll make sure that Massachusetts families that have been working here and, and you know, trying to raise their families and, and paying into the system are the ones getting help first. Um, and I think that's really important. So there's already bipartisan support here. This isn't anything new. This isn't anything extreme. Um, but we see our neighboring communities, you know, obviously down in Kingston, um, have been affected by this. And you know, some people want to push it off because, oh, well, we don't have any hotels. We're actually one of the few districts down here that have zero hotels in the 6th. Um, they were actually looking at some community homes in Pembroke, mm -hmm. um, so they've already tried to scout that out. Mm -hmm. And there was some news as well, if you hadn't seen, I believe it was a week or two ago in New York City, where they actually closed school and put the students all remote and housed migrant families in the school's cool. gymnasiums. That's, to me, unacceptable. You know, we, we need to have our schools open. We've lost so much time during COVID. Um, we can't be putting our schools or, or any you know, community buildings or, or programs at a deficit for this, for this issue. There, there has to be better solutions. I mean, you know, we have plenty of schools in the district. We, there's a brand new community center that's about to open in Pembroke. Right. You would hate to see any of these buildings, these public buildings being Probably used. Weird. Yes, exactly. And I think that people should really be more, even more weary than they already are because it's not gonna be limited to hotels. Where, with where we are at, this, it's gonna get a lot a lot worse in, in both regards. You you mentioned loosely the, the governor, governor's budget. Uh, she just did her State of the Commonwealth address. Uh, anything in her speech that resonated with you and provides fuel for fire in your uh, run for state rep? Yeah, there's a couple things. One, I think that it's real easy to see the effects of one party control in the state. Um, I by no means define myself as, as, as a party man, if you will. You know, I really am trying to represent um, the middle of the road view that's prevalent in the 6th Plymouth here. But when we had Governor Baker, there was just a little bit more check and balance. And, you know, he couldn't sustain a veto, which I think was a problem during his time. But this, this back and forth with the supermajority in the legislature and a, and a Democratic governor generally, I think people are going to feel the effects pretty, pretty harshly and pretty suddenly uh, this year in specific. So I think that overarching tone is really prevalent. Um, I know in her State of the Commonwealth there was a lot of talk about housing, and she's going to also be pretty aggressive on housing. Um, they talked about the MBTA overlay zones and the housing zones, which affects, I believe, every town, if not four out of our five towns in the sixth. Um, you know, I don't believe any of our towns are at our 10 percent affordable housing either. Um, so the more aggressive they're getting with these MBTA housing zones, 40B, whatever it may be, of course affordability is a big problem. I mean, as a young person trying to buy a home with the interest rates and the affordability in Massachusetts, it's not, it, it's not a good situation. And I understand the urgency that the governor has there or that anybody would have. But to, to put our towns at the detriment, to have that burden be borne by the towns, I mean, sitting in this selectman's office, there's going to be hard conversations that are going to have to be had if Hanson, who's only at five, six percent last time I looked, I believe, um, you know, needing to get to that 10 on affordable housing for those who may not know what I'm referring, that 10 percent minimum. Um, you know, the state's going to have a lot more leeway on, on what they're doing to municipalities. So the, just a few of, of the many um, sort of over, overtones that you can see in when, when you hear the governor speak. It's interesting when you talk about affordable housing, that 10 percent, that's like, it's, you know, communities struggle because the the number is always going up and down, up and down. It's, it's a moving target to actually try to hit that bullseye. And then what you do, then again, you know, again, it, it fluctuates. Um, let's talk about as far as, you know, what your constituents are saying. Um, what do they feel are some of the key issues that they care about in this, in the three, the four communities that are represented? And how do those line up with some of the issues that are near and dear to you as a candidate? 
Yep, absolutely. So, I mean, I think the what we've already talked about, budgeting, local aid, immigration, Correct. those are things I'm hearing from constituents as well, right? That's just not me pontificating from on high here. Um, but as well as, you know, the more, even bringing it down another level, I mean, like I said, grew up in, you know, a family that was running a small business. I'm talking to a lot of people that run small businesses or just, you know, trying to raise their families and things. And I mean, obviously not everything's going to get solved at, at the state level, but, you know, inflation being out of control. People are obviously talking about that. That. And now we're talking about, uh, you know, the governor, again, not to go back to her, but is talking about no new taxes and then allowing municipalities to raise taxes, um, you know, for meals, for hotels, um, and even a potential 5% additional on your excise tax. So people that are, you know, trying to get by right now and already have bills and then, like I said, inflation, whether it's the grocery store or heating or whatever it may be, and now the state is just allowing our municipalities that, you know, they can't help because the local aid is being cut. So they're like, oh, well, you can tax your own residents. Um, and that's not going to help individuals, right? It's always that balance. I always say that I'm here to advocate for individuals and families, businesses, and our towns. Well, those things can't be in conflict, right? So, so we need to help our, t our towns, like I said, by getting that aid from the state that people have already paid in. It's a, this isn't a handout. This is our money that we've already paid into right. the state system. And now the state's saying, oh no, well, we're cutting all of your local aid. So here you go. You can then raise your own money by raising taxes. And that's hurting the individual and our businesses. So we need those three things to all be, you know, going forward in the same direction here, right? And, and that's sort of what people are feeling. They're very weary, again, of this, um, you know, single party rule that taxes will go up, local aid is going down, um, and then basically worried that they're not going to be protected or there's no plan in place. Really, it's more that there's no plan in place for this shelter crisis. So, I mean, this is what people are talking about. They're very concerned and, and the fear is that it's going to get worse. And I have to say, I don't, I don't blame them. If you are successful in November, probably one of the things that we'll, um, you'll have to focus on is how to take care of the folks in your district, constituent services. What's your plan for constituent services and being able to help the regular Joe in one of the communities you serve? Yep, absolutely. So this is super, super important. And I know we're, we're talking a lot about policy here, right? Yeah. Um, but 50% of the job, at least, is constituent services. And what I always say uh, is the, one of the biggest problems with government after policy is its accessibility. It's very inaccessible to the average person. You know, there are people that go to the government or go to their state rep and, you know, get services. And we did see it during COVID. I think a, a silver lining of it was a lot of people understood how to navigate that system because there were so many people in need. And I think that the legislature uh, on both sides everywhere stepped up their game there. And I thought that was good. But if you asked you know, the average person on the street, hey, how can you apply for unemployment? They would be lost. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't even know that going to their state rep or their state government's a possibility. They wouldn't know. Um, you know I, you, you'd hate to hear of anyone on hard times just getting lost in a search engine trying to figure out how to get benefits from the state. So that accessibility is a big problem. So constituent services, obviously super important. But the dynamic that I think is important to bring that's different is I need to go out. The government in general needs to go out. They can't sit back and be like, oh, well, we have this great system in place and this great policy and this funding for just unemployment as an example, but any, any service, you know, streets and stop signs, whatever it might be. Um, we need to go out. You know, it's, it, the onus is on us, and it should be on us. And I believe that the onus would be on me to go out and say, hey, these are the services that, you know, you're entitled to, that we can assist you with, and whether that's town halls, whether that's forums, whether that's a podcast, whether that's, you know, visiting you weekly um, to, to inform them, whatever that may be, the onus is on us to go out. And, and that would be a really, really big focus. I think that's indicative of how we run our campaign as well. Um, you know, no one knocked more doors than I did in the district last time. No one's going to knock more doors than me this time. I can guarantee that. Um, so I, that's indicative of the campaign. Um, every single day we're out there working for the votes and for your support. And it would be the exact same thing um, when we're successful. We're going to be out there making sure that you have everything you need. Again, towns, families, and businesses, everybody. What's your strategy as far as local aid goes? Because that's going to be the thing that when it comes to the municipalities that they're going to call on to, to seek funding, whether it's for Chapter 90 money, which is, you know, roads and bridges, whether it's Chapter 70 money, because, you know, I think one of your, one of your uh, communities, I believe Hanson, where we're in, is a regional school district. Um, what's, you know, what is your strategy to be able to be able to bring back the bacon 
to the district? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. There's a couple different things there with that as well. One, I think that particularly with these cuts that we're going to experience this year, um, you know, nine C cuts, correct? Yeah. Well, even beyond that. Beyond that, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Beyond that, and I think the big issue is going to be. I, pe we have to take a hard look at the budget, right? Um, and it's not just shelter specific, which is a big piece of it. I mean, we have, you know, a bloated bureaucracy. I believe in Massachusetts as well. I don't think that many you know, good faith actors looking at it would disagree with that, honestly. You know, to say that local aid and earmarks are going to be the first things that are cut is incredibly unfair, again, to the residents and to our towns. It's, it's not right. The, the government needs to be able to take a step back, whether it's the legislature and they're budgeting the governor, and say that they're going to bear the brunt of this too. You know, we can't have offices expanding. We can't have, uh, you know, bureaucrats constantly, you know, handing down unfunded mandates, whether that might be, you know, wh whatever it is, any regulation on businesses or ecological, you know, people are dealing with beach access over in Duxbury, for example, and that's a bureaucrat who's, who's making regulations out of that that need to be fixed. And mm. so first, I'd say cutting out some of the bloat in the government is a big piece. Um, and of course, you know, you can uh, compromise, of course. Uh, as a state rep, uh, it's no secret I'm going to be in the super minority. Um, you know, and there's going to have to be compromise so that, you know, I got to work with, I have a lot of towns that are split. I split a town with, in Marshfield, is split with Rep Kearney. I'm split with Deco uh, Rep DeCoast here in Hanson. Um, the school district you just mentioned, Whitman Hanson, also is covered by Rep Allison Sullivan, Pembroke with Kathleen Lenatra. So you see, there's a, this is a unique district where we have five towns and four of them are split. So we have a lot of opportunities for partnership, which I think in the end will actually be good for the towns because mm. they'll have multiple reps that are advocating for them. School districts will have multiple reps advocating for them. I think that's a really good thing. So that sort of compromise and, and sort of ability to work with people on both sides of the aisle. And that's not compromising values. That's not compromising you know, policy. That's just making sure that we're doing the things we need to do to get your money and your local aid back into our towns and hopefully back into your hands as well. So. The thing I would say, and I, I know for a, a, a fact that if you are successful, um, that the South Shore legislation, or the South Shore uh, legislative delegation, is like none other. And regardless of your party affiliation, you're pretty fortunate that a, a lot of the, the names that you mentioned all work well together, and they're very like-minded mm -hmm. in regards to a lot of the initiatives and getting things done for the folks down here south of Boston. Um, Let's shift gears real quick here. You're successful in November. Uh, you go in as a freshman legislator. Uh, you get an opportunity as far as committee assignments, right? I'm sure that the, you've got a little bit of a wish list. Uh, what are some of the things that you, how would you like to serve your district on, on a, a variety of um, committees? Yeah. So I'd say one of the rare good parts about being in the super minority is we get to be on a lot more committees uh, than our Democratic counterparts. So they have to divide it amongst whatever 120 representatives or plus, and we have to divide the same number of committees amongst about 40, 30 Republicans. So I can assure you I will be on a lot. Um, but as far as the wish list that you mentioned, I mean, obviously, of course, everyone wants to be on Ways and Means. Ways and means yeah. We're talking a lot about budgeting, and of course, that would always be good. You, you want your rep on that. Um, but, you know, a lot of the work that I've done or the things that, you know, my life experience, I think uh, economic development um, would be a, a place where I would really, really love to serve. Um, I've done that work here in Hanson. It was very productive. I really enjoyed the municipal partnerships I already made with the selectmen uh, during that process in this town. Um, I'd like to do that across all five of the towns. So work, um, excuse me, economic development, I think, um, would be a great opportunity. And I think that South Shore, um, you know, there's so many small businesses down here and the businesses are incredibly diverse in this district in particular. You're going from, you know, lobstermen and, and, and oyster farms and Duxbury all the way over to, you know, like fence companies and, and a lot of, um, you know, lawn care and restaurants and mom and pops. And it's a very economically diverse district, you know, from the ocean all the way in. Um, so I think it's a really, really pivotal one, and that one I'd really like to do and make sure that those businesses are supported in that way as well. Um, public safety as well, the Committee on Public Safety, I think is really important. They were the ones who heard police reform a couple years ago. Mm. Um, they were the ones who, even more recently than that, were, were hearing more um, bills about qualified immunity. Um, and then my background, right? I, like I said, I was a civilian, worked in law enforcement for four years, 
the appreciation that I have for what we do. I have a great relationship already with all the chiefs in the district as well from my last run up and through now. Um, you know, I love to, you know, our, we're so lucky we have amazing, amazing law enforcement officers. Um, the chiefs are always very involved. You know, you have your stuff at cruiser events. Uh, the blood drives are constant in this area. They're back out in the community. The relief associations that help both fallen officer families as well as local charities. So we have incredibly civically engaged police departments here. They're always getting out there. Their doors are always open. I've never heard of them not taking a meeting with anybody, no matter what your concerns are. Um, so, so we're very fortunate here. And so being on public safety to make sure that they have a voice as well, um, police and fire, um, would be really important. And that would be an, a small way that I could give back to them and make sure that our communities are, are safe. You just kind of uh, stimulated a thought I was going to ask you. You talk about law enforcement. One of the things that we have seen over the past legislative session, uh, almost like a knee-jerk reaction whenever we see gun violence around the country, is, is we, we need stronger, we need stiffer uh, gun laws on the books. And I know most recently there was a, there was a push to, to do some modification, but the, the, um, the message of the Commonwealth uh, police chiefs Oh, like this. This is no good. Um, give me your thoughts on that. And and a second part of that is is that two of your two of the you know, parts of your district, Marshfield and and Duxbury, are coastal communities. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's anything where we're at. We're kind of more of an inland uh, uh, community TV station. Yeah. Um, if you're trying to get out to the voters in that part, talk about uh, uh, coastal resiliency, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. So. Two big things there. You Two, gave me. huge, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, as you mentioned, the police officers, the unions, the chiefs, um, we love when they're on the same page, and they are pretty universally against some of the new legislation that's been proposed. Right. Um, and two parts of that, we, we have plenty of gun laws in Massachusetts. If all of those were enforced, we would have even less gun violence. Right. Massachusetts is also one of the safest states in the nation by a long shot. We have fewer homicides per 100,000, which is how the FBI tracks data, than, than like 45 other states. So we're a very safe community. To say that law-abiding citizens that have guns is anywhere near a problem is, is fallacy. And it's, it's disingenuous, unfortunately, in most cases, the way it's described. But the legislation specifically actually punishes um, retired cops, lose a lot of their rights. Here in Massachusetts, they're able to buy certain things that they had while they were on duty or maintain certain firearms, things like that. They lose a lot of those with new legislation and, and punishes police officers for retiring. They'd have to either sell or forfeit firearms from when they were act. It's, it, it's really getting down into some crazy stuff. If you Ghost know. guns, too. Right? Isn't ghost guns also another part of the the legislation that they're they're pushing? Yeah. So I believe there's language in there on it, but in Massachusetts, a lot of that stuff's already illegal. Mm. Um, and the, again, with this legislation, it's I think some of it comes from an ignorance. A lot of people just don't understand firearms in Massachusetts. Um, you know, I've been a gun owner. I you know I've been a member of ranges. I'm not currently, but I've been a member of the the ranges in this the, the area as well. And you know those are the most responsible people you'll ever meet. I mean you never have an accident or anything at any of these clubs. And you know there's loopholes unfortunately that they can still get in here. But if those were closed and we enforced our current gun laws, there's no need for more either bureaucratic red tape. There's no need for more legislation to penalize retired officer. I mean, it's, it's like I said, starting to get a little far down the line on the, on the firearm legislation. And I, th I definitely um, sympathize with everyone who, you know, you see there's, there's been a hot button issue. There's signs all over the district of people that want to stop the, the current legislation. And, and I, can, I can promise that that is high on the priority list as well to make sure that, you know, law abiding citizens don't get punished. Um, so that will certainly be a priority. Um, Second part. Yes, yes. For coastal communities, a couple big issues. Um, you know, you, we've seen, obviously, uh, extreme weather that comes up. We just saw some pretty, um, I don't want to say historic, but some pretty damaging flooding that just occurred over in Duxbury specifically. I actually met um, with some uh, first responders shortly after that, and they were discussing that, you know, luckily, we're, we're very well equipped fire and police in the area, particularly in our coastal communities, uh, are prepared for this, which is good. So the residents are safe. That's important. Obviously, the front end help, right, is whether that's seawall um, infrastructure that needs to be replaced, built up, 
anything like that. That's the sort of place where, you know, a municipality is not prepared for multi-million dollar seawall replacements, for example, right? Or even some beach nourishment programs or, or, or replacing dunes on the beach, things like that. A town, a, a one-off expense from a storm can cripple our municipalities. And we're fortunate where our towns are, are pretty, um, our coastal communities in particular are, are very, uh, you know, financially responsible. But a one-time cost like that can, can ruin all that. So that's when the state needs to step up, right? And, and I would be there advocating for that every step of the way because that has back-end costs. Like I just mentioned, if, if you're not investing in the beaches, you're not investing in the seawalls, that's creating you know, obvious safety concerns to both residents and our first responders, as well as the costs associated with that. So it's, it's, it's actually smart financial sense to, to invest into the coastal infrastructure. As well, we also have, um, you know, ecological and biological concerns over on the beach. Like I mentioned, the bureaucratic red tape, um, a big issue, if I may, in the district is beach access over in Duxbury. Very, very big issue. And I've talked to a lot of people over in Duxbury that are very upset about it. And, you know, there's certain things that can be done. Some things can't be done, like, uh, you know, the plovers, for example. Piping plovers. Yes, I know. The, you naughty see the eyes go up. Those naughty little birds. Yes, that's a federally protected bird. Yeah, they are. Um, you know, and I'm not going to pretend that there's, I can wave a magic wand to change that. But there, there's also concerns about the, the least turns that are not federally protected. Yeah. Um, that's state red tape right there, plain and simple. That's something that can be fixed. Sure. That's something that should be fixed. Um, Beach access has to be given. I mean, that's the economy over there is thriving and depends upon summer visitors, summer residents. I mean, you have all the restaurants over there, whether it's, you know, the Maritime Academy that's in Duxbury. The, the, there's so much that depends on beach access over there. Yeah, it, yeah, the, the oyster farmers. I mean, there's so much over there. Um, so that's something that has to be fixed. That's going to be a very, very high priority. Um, and then you also have, if I may, just one last thing mm -hmm. uh, for our coastal communities in particular, um, is you know protecting our lobstermen, our fishermen, uh, the oystermen. You have all this. Uh, you know, we talked a lot two years ago about offshore wind. We talk a lot about banning vertical lines. We talk about a lot of these things that again aren't really connected to reality. There's not a lot of demonstrable truth to or evidence that this is actually affecting the right whales. Half the time the windmills themselves are emitting things that are affecting the right whales or the construction out there is hurting them. So a lot of these, you know, I am not sort of anti any climate initiative in particular, but it needs to make sense. Um, it needs to be safe um, and, and it can't hurt, again, our, our small businesses, our families and individuals and our towns. Um, so protecting the, the thriving economy that we have over there in Duxbury, Marshfield, coastal communities and again throughout with just different businesses is of the utmost importance. I want to digress to our the first question I asked you in that uh, that series. Uh, shout out to the Hanson Rod and Gun Club. It's been years since I had a chance to go there, but they have a, a fantastic group of uh, folks who are there and, and a great organization. So um, we're at that time where I ask you, is there anything during our conversation I have not asked you, but you feel is really important to sharing with the folks who are viewing this? Yeah, um, I, I, we did a great job of covering a lot of issues today. In a, a in the, yes, which is, which is good. Um, one I'd say is, again, about that receptiveness and about going out to the people. There's, there's issues that are number one issues to people that we didn't cover. Mm. And I would say that uh, I want to hear about those too. You know, I, I am absolutely happy whatever legislation may be up you know, to, to, to take a stance on and to hear what's most important to you if there's something that's hurting your business, hurting your family, um, you know, schools. Um, and with that, actually, one of the big issues that I think we need an advocate for and, and a solution is actually about uh, Votech schooling. That's a really, really big issue. Um, statewide, I think funding is a problem, but particularly in our district and in Pembroke, they're having a big fight about, um, you know, joining the Votech um, school district because they're not. And I believe that's the only municipality of the five that is not a part of a Votech. I think we all know the great value that a Votech uh, education can bring to you. South Shore Votech in particular is an amazing school. Um, so we need to make sure that every student that wants that education, not only make sure our towns are a part of those districts, but there's long waiting lists there, excuse me. And I mean, even the students that want to go in Hanson or Halifax or Duxbury Marshfield that want to go, don't always get to go. And, and to me, that's a huge problem. There needs to be a huge focus shift on Votech um, education, like I mentioned, all those small businesses that require that sort of special skill. Um, and we see the way the economy is going right now. I mean, you're having truck drivers and electricians that are making two, three, four times of bachelor degree holders. I mean, that's 
That, that's a great thing, I think, um, but clearly a need where we need to ramp this up tremendously. I mean, that would be a great place maybe where, you know, partnering with, for example, the Department of Labor would be a, a great uh, opportunity for us with the, our former representative. And, um, you know, Votech education in general, I think there needs to be a pathway to get every student that, whether that's sending them to a Votech or placing the funds so that, hey, the people that don't get into that school can still have those opportunities at, say, Whitman Hanson Regional or Pembroke or, you know, Duxbury Marshfield, Silver Lake, wherever it may be. So, yeah. uh, Social technical or social Votech as it's uh, fondly known as, I believe, Marshfield and Hanson are the only two communities in the district that are part of that of the nine uh, um, not nine community consortium that are part of the Votech. It'd be nice if Pembroke joined. Yep. I don't think Duxbury is a part of it. They are not. Um, but very interesting. It was a good uh, fa closing comment. Um, if folks want to find out more, maybe there's a question that they have on their mind. They want to reach out to your campaign. How can they do that? Yeah, absolutely. Like you mentioned, if there's any sort of concerns or, or questions that you have, or if you'd like to get involved, volunteer, uh, support, anything like that, our, our website is already live. It's not, it's not fully up to where it was two years ago, but it will be shortly. Mm -hmm. So you can go to sweezyforstaterep.com. That's sweezy, F-O-R for staterep.com. We're very active on Facebook and Instagram as well. Uh, so our most up to the minute things will be on there. So please follow us. But we are pretty responsive on emails and you can contact us all through the website or through social media as well. Well, well thank you for your time. Thank you as always. And we'll thank you for tuning into a program like this. The idea of shows like this is to better inform you as an individual about the, uh, the people who are seeking your vote and hoping to work for you up uh, at the State House. Uh, we look forward to more conversations, and until next time, have yourself a great day.